Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Oren Elias, and I'm the general manager of Coder Z at Intellitech, and very glad to welcome you to our third webinar in our series of STEM webinars. For those of you who are not familiar with us, Intellitech has been a pioneer of robotics and education for over 30 years. Our latest innovation, Coder Z, is an online learning environment that gives students worldwide the opportunity to program virtual robots using 3D simulations while meeting key STEM curriculum goals. Coder Z makes robotics for education accessible, affordable, and enjoyable. You can learn about more about Coder Z by visiting gocoderz.com or by following Coder Z on Facebook and Twitter. One of the main questions we always face when thinking about STEM is how flexible, adaptable, and customizable is the STEM education model? How can we make it fit our own reality, society, city, or country? Today, we're going to learn about a global approach to STEM education and discover how to adapt STEM to make it fit in different realities and different contexts. A few technicalities before we begin. I encourage all participants to submit questions throughout the event. To submit a question, simply type it in the chat box in the lower corner of the GoToWebinar control panel. We will try to stop for questions during the webinar and at the end of the webinar. And now I'm very proud to introduce our speaker, Oscar Contreras Villarroel. Oscar is the founder and president of Youth Science Foundation. He is a STEM education specialist and an active science advocate. He is also the executive director of Echo Science Foundation, a science and environment philanthropic foundation. Oscar holds a BSc in biochemistry a master's in public policy, and a diploma in public policy from the University of Chicago. Oscar, the audience is all yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thank you for attending this webinar today. Well, I would like to start <clears throat> first uh, talking or sharing a little bit of my experience. Uh, and perhaps I will not be focusing on my academic experience, rather through my life experience, which has always come to science and technology. Since I was in high school, I was always related and always participated in every single science fair that was available in Chile. I usually formed STEM clubs at my high school and usually was very eager to attend or be part of any science related project. Um, that's why then after when I had to enter into university, I decided to combine the two main subjects that I liked the most, which was biology and, bi and chemistry. And that's why I ended up studying biochemistry as my major. <clears throat> Throughout my life in university I started realizing and after a couple of years working in a laboratory that I was much more interested in how science can be connected to society through different ways and mainly that education was an excellent vehicle to promote science development and to help other societies and other members of the society that were not related to science understand and most importantly appreciate science and technology. That's why in my last year of university uh, I decided to found my first organization which was the Jude Science Foundation, uh, a nonprofit that was based in Santiago and Valparaiso in Chile and had the main mission to improve STEM education in Chile. That was in around 2011 and STEM education 
was not well known as a concept here in Chile. So we were one of the pioneers to introduce STEM into the curriculum and into other non-formal activities of education. Uh, then afterwards, I founded a startup which is still growing, and it's called TechnoValue. And we are a company that develops STEM educational kits, so teachers around Chile and hopefully soon other countries could have technology and st educational strategies to teach STEM into their classroom. And finally, as it was mentioned in my introduction, I am currently the executive director of EcoScience Foundation, a um, philanthropic foundation that supports science research, science education, and ecology conservation in projects in Chile. <clears throat> so, Coming from my background, which was related to science, education, and afterwards uh, public policy, I started to think of how our organization could grow and help to promote STEM education into the different backgrounds and scenarios that could be found in Chile. Chile is a very diverse country. It's a very long, narrow piece of land in South America. And this gives us some benefits, but also some challenges into the different strategies that high school used to teach, the different backgrounds that students may have. So it has always been a challenge to adapt and to expand on a specific program, a program that could be adapted to all of the cultural diversity in our country. So <clears throat> when we started thinking, what would be the, the main programs or the first program that Jude Science Foundation could implement? We decided that understanding the local context of Chile, which uh, was a priority, and that our main job would be to find a way to adapt programs and STEM-related programs to our own cultural background, uh, not designing new <coughs> non-existent programs. That's how we decided to understand that we needed to have this global approach or how we understand it which is a student-centered approach or a beneficiary-centered approach depending on with which uh, whether you're going to work with students or teachers. Um, so for us understanding that every program should be centered not on the organization that it's implemented the program but rather than on the final user um, was a way to, so we could adapt uh, and fit all of the different programs that we were assessing um, to, to implement. <clears throat> so before we ever started uh, designing a project or trying to adapt an international program of STEM into the Chilean culture, um, we understood that we require three different areas. Um, this is our perspective. First is to understand that STEM education is incorporated into uh, broader education, and that if we want to promote STEM skills, we would also need to promote the soft skill or leadership. That's why we understand this STEM education as a personal de level development in a whole. Also, we needed to first assess the student context and that way we could design or adapt a program understanding what the situation was like and what were the students facing. And lastly, but I think most importantly, is that we always started small, meaning that we usually pilot the, the project first into maybe one school or maybe a couple of students and then we measure it and we did a little bit of feedback and then improve it before going out into the big program. I think this is a key role for us into this adaptability scheme, understanding that having a dynamic program that could be measured and improved constantly is a key to success to this global approach. But what all of this means, it's mainly that we are considering two main topics when having an adaptability or 
this global approach to global programs into a local context is first is that we incorporated a lot of design into our proposals. Um, we usually understand that if you want to have a successful program, you need to have a very good design process at the beginning, understanding all of the stakeholders and all of the things that could affect the program. And second of all is that this adaptability must be incorporated in the core values of your organizations or your classroom or whichever area you want to implement it. Is that you have to be willing to constantly adapt, evaluate, assess and make improvements to your program so that your programs can respond to the environment needs and of course to the response your users or your beneficiary, whether that be teachers or students are having to the program. So we would like, I would like to share two experiences of how we actually adapted two very well known international models of STEM education, but introduced them for the first time in the Chilean context and afterwards into other Latin American countries. <coughs> First of all, I would like to share with you the case of the Bayer Kimlu Science Camp. Uh, this is a collaboration between the Dude Science Foundation and the German company Bayer. Um, so it was earlier 2011, late 2010, and we as scientists or educators that were working together in the Dude Science Foundation uh, were actually <coughs> asking ourselves to why wasn't there any science camp in Chile? And what would happen if we implement a science camp in Latin America? Uh, assume if you're from the States, you know that uh, summer camps are very popular in certain countries, but for the Chilean context it's very, or at least at that time, it was very rare to have, uh, or to send your kids to a camp away from the family. And we needed to perhaps understand if we wanted to adapt this international experience, how or how we could assess our communities and more importantly, uh, we wanted to capitalize in the previous experience of running a science camp abroad. So <clears throat> we, again, we have this human-centered approach and we started to ask ourselves to, what were the dynamics of the Chilean context. So we were asking our Chilean kids the same after you know, kids abroad, their parents are similar, what are the differences between our educational system and most importantly do we have, did we have the same holiday culture here in Chile? Um, and we started to figure out that we have a lot of differences and the main thing to have clear or that I would like to <clears throat> iterate again, if you understand the questions that I'm sharing with you, none of them are related to the STEM curriculum uh, or to the STEM subject we want to perhaps promote into, uh, into this program. We're all related into the context in which we were going to apply certain mythology. Uh, so I think into, again to iterate, into having this global perspective is not to understanding all of the curriculum, but rather what is the context of the community in which you want to work with. Uh, so after having all of this assessment and actually having all of some tries and error, the small and first at the beginning, we ended up with the concept of the Bayer Kim in the Science Camp, which was this, which is a long-term collaboration between the Jude Science Foundation uh, and the pharmaceutical company Bayer, which is one of the biggest companies in health, develop, health research, uh, crop development, and until our previous year, chemical material development. And we decided that we wanted to inspire the next generation of STEM leaders. And <clears throat> so here it changes a little bit the perspective of perhaps a summer camp. It wasn't recreational. Um, it wasn't about what can I do with kids uh, during the summer. It actually had a major 
objective as a program which requests a very long-term uh, perspective of STEM leaders. Uh, this pro program has been running for six years. Uh, each year we have more than 600 applicants for a 40 slot. Uh, we are now working with students from Chile, Argentina and Uruguay. And one of the main outcomes of this program is that 90% of our alumni go into STEM related careers. And <clears throat> we needed to understand that this program was also would be operating to students from different backgrounds, different contexts. And so the experience is designed more as a social program uh, with a very STEM charge curriculum and I'm going to tell you a little bit now of how it works and the examples and how we have been adapted the traditional science curriculum based in workshops to a more active and <coughs> a program that uses all of the biodiversity that Chile offers. <coughs> so every year uh, 40 students are selected and participate in a 12-day program that usually is hosted in a remote location uh, and all of them participate in the Bioarchim Blue Science Camp. Um, usually all of these programs are hosted at a very south point of Chile. As you can see, it requires traveling by airplane, uh, a vessel, land and it usually goes to the south part of Chile, which is Punta Arenas, and we try to work in a national or private public park that can help us inspire these students. We work with them into science workshop uh, and science thinking workshop in to teach them or to work with the students how, well, which one are the skills that they require to think as scientists and to face program problems as scientists. Uh, all the curriculum of the program is not based on <clears throat> subjects or some topics that we want them to learn, but rather on how they can think and how they as young people or afterwards citizens can solve program with a scientific perspective. And we usually work in some of the most amazing national ha natural habitats or national parks in Chile and I would just adventure to say Latin America, maybe some of them the world. And we use and capitalize on the incredible potential that these places have. And to the perhaps the most exciting part about the program is that we're taking kids outside of the classroom and implement STEM activities into this remote location that you perhaps may not have ever imagined that you can run a STEM program. So each of the students work in areas of their interests. So we separate them and work with them in chemistry, biology, math, engineering, physics, health, ecology. The most important is that they work in areas that are of their interest and they work with a facilitator and a coach uh, that is an expert in these areas and guides them into this 12-day program in which they have to answer a scientific questions that they identify and they decided themselves accordingly to their interest. And so throughout all of this work in the park, uh, they set these questions and this big challenge that they want to solve or they want to understand. And we do what we like to call science trekking or science adventures in which they actually have to they go out into expeditions for one to two days and they do all of the field work and understand that also science is not, it's, it, has, it doesn't have to actually happen always in a laboratory or you don't require incredibly expensive uh, equipment or anything, but just to having a very clear uh, question you need to solve and have this design or you have been using the science process, you could actually solve this problem. Um, so they explore the park 
um, with the science perspective. So it's it's not now a very nice place they're actually visiting or mes get mesmerized by their beauty, but they are actually facing and solving a scientific questions while visiting the park. We also do a lot of outdoors activities that are related to our team building and leadership uh, workshops that we do. As we come back to the first things I said, uh, we, we understand the STEM education into a personal development scheme. Uh, so two of, for, I would like to share two cases. For example, students identify different types of soils in the park and usually evaluate and compare the differences between the biodiversity that they can find in those places. And we've had students that try to identify some active compounds that could have uh, bioactive activities of such as uh, antibacterial properties or among others and we usually have the health related team that actually they do not study the park but rather they study each other to determine what is the health impact uh, these outdoors activities have on them. So as you can see uh, we actually don't <coughs> quote unquote, care about the science of what they're doing or the topic that they are developing, but we rather care and we focus on the process and the way they're thinking to solve a questions that they set themselves. So after each program, we evaluate and make improvement to each year and we're willing to make, and we're willing to make big changes, whether that be the amount of time that we spend in the park, the amount of activities we are willing to delete or to change completely huge um, portions of our curriculum if we figure out that, they, that it's not working or that it is not having the impact that we are aiming for. So our program is actually a long-term program. So we have a very active alumni network and we promote activities that they actually want to do after the camps finished. And we have some very tremendous success with the students. Uh, we've had some alumni that even while they're in high school have come up to participate into the International Junior Water Prize. And in 2013, uh, two alumni of our program actually won the Stockholm Junior Water Prize, which was a tremendous news to Chile, but also the first time a Latin American team won it. And we have some other students like Pablo who is now studied at Harvard University, a science related career. And we promote this international network to help these kids actually achieve greater than they perhaps may have the opportunities beforehand. Uh, so as you may understand or as the point I was trying to make clear, uh, we didn't create this new approach to STEM education that is a science camp. It's been running for a long time. But what we did is we sat down and we worked into how to adapt this global program into the local context. And it has allowed us to grow it into different countries in Latin America and have a long-term solution to it. And these long-term partnerships with the stakeholders that allow us to finance the program. Another experience that I would like to share with you is the, is the experience working in high school directly. Uh, we started with the same question as we did with the CAM, and it was what would happen if we implement STEM clubs in Chilean high school. As you may be, me, as you may be very well aware, STEM clubs are very popular to have different approaches to it. Uh, so we wanted to understand what would be like to implement one of these clubs in Chile. So what we did is to assess the international context and understand what are the different kinds of curriculum that other organizations are implemented around the world. And we came to understand that all of the clubs abroad usually were focused on the students. Uh, usually it was uh, the curriculum was developed for the students uh, and every material was designed for the students and the teachers would consider us only perhaps a facilitator 
or a person in between the operation team of the organization and the students. But assessing the local context in Chile, we realized that our main challenge uh, was to focus not on the students, but on the teachers. And we actually have to, we had to change the entire perspective of our program because we understood that if we didn't work with the teachers first, uh, no matter how good our program was with students, we were not going to be able to fulfill our objective, which was to implement and develop long-term competences in the high school that wouldn't depend on us. <clears throat> so by understanding that our final user was actually going to be the teacher in this STEM club, uh, it made a whole new difference in the type of activities we, decide, we designed, uh, are implemented, the type of cooperation and implementation methods we decided to do, where, because all of them were focused on the teachers, not on the students. And um, so understanding how could we incorporate the final beneficiary, uh, which was the teachers, into the design process, we did what we call a co-design process, was in which we selected a couple of teachers that were going to be that we were going to be working with and we invited them to our office and they became an active te team member of the foundation and they were actually part of the design process of the program uh, perhaps this might sound a very simple or a very common thing but when you are working and it may happen to you as administrators of stem programs when you're working at a university or a nonprofit level, you usually have your expert team and you design and then you contact with the beneficiary at the very end and then you measure it. So what we decided to, to, to implement into this global approach was to invite the teachers into the design table and make them an active part of the process. This way it could self, uh, save us time and a lot of other perhaps uh, problems that we could have just realized at the very end. Uh, so we have this five stages process and this is based actually on the design thinking process uh, which is gathering a lot of people implemented it in the educational level. So we have five stages of the process which was the first to empathize. Um, it was to understand that the final beneficiary of the program, it's a person. So by empathizing with him and for us, that meant to invite them into the design process and call it a co-design process with the final user was a key strategy to actually have a much more better impact. So afterward, it was the defined stage. Uh, and this is a very important part of it, which is actually to frame the work, frame the problem that we want to um, tackle because perhaps the approaches you want to implement will depend extremely on the defined problem that you have. Uh, and this was very easy for us because we had the teachers, the one that are having the problem firsthand on the table so they were able to share all of their ideas. So after what we, you, we you did, ideate what we are going to do, we have some sessions or understanding how we can achieve this uh, outcome that we want to have. Uh, and in this implementation of international programs, we actually started creating our program based on the international experience and creating up on that experience. Um, and this was very helpful because it helped us adapt international programs um, and having this global perspective that things that are working in other places could actually work in our communities if we make some changes. And then we usually prototype um, and this meant not only like having a draft document of the program, but actually having a small session of interactive with other teachers to, chat, to try to share the ideas. And finally, we always tested a small, 
which meant we always pilot first, maybe in one high school, get some evaluation, feedback, and then improve. And then we actually scaled in our program to the, I don't know, around 150 high schools that we are working right now. <clears throat> and so working with this, we actually understood that one of the main things, yet again, was not the science curriculum, which you can find in some papers, some documents, and even on the internet of how you can actually develop science competences. But it actually, again, came to the human center approach that we needed to actually understand that STEM clubs were an incredible opportunity to promote diversity of girls, boys, and different backgrounds into science and actually help the students understand that no matter where they come, they could actually develop the same skills and have perhaps the same prospect for the future. And this adaptability into the different high school and actually that we decided to work with the teachers allow us to focus on local pro problems. Um, our project, our program has a main course and then it has some approach to help the students and the teachers participating in our program to solve some local problems. So one of the, ex a lot of examples that projects that have come out of this program is for example, students that want to improve their ecological uh, diversity or their green areas in their high school. So they study and even design some different approaches or how they can have some better fertilizers to low cost and how they can actually design some greener spacers uh, into their high school at the understanding the context of how that might work. You need to understand that from the 150 high school that we work, 95% of them are from a low income communities. So usually these areas are issues that either the high school administrators or the local government cannot uh, actually achieve because they have other programs. And we've also have students or in high schools that are assessing the quality of water nearby their school uh, because it's usually said that it's contaminated because of the industries that work nearby their school building. So what we're doing here is that this STEM club is actually helping to understand if that is an actual problem or is just misinformation about the context and how science can actually be a tool to help even the, the decision-making people around the school to, or having some conscious awareness campaign uh, and to what this problem really means to their community. We have other students that actually have designed uh, some clean energy strategies, mainly because their high school has a huge lack of good infrastructure. So they've created some efficient solar power system to actually warm water. So when they take showers in their high school, they actually have access to hot water. Uh, even though we're coming from a country that is on the path to development, we still have high school from low income that their infrastructure is very deficient. So students use science to solve these issues that are affecting not not just them, but the entire community. And we have other students that are actually are identifying um, the biodiversity around their school and understanding how that is an information or how that is an asset that all of the communities should know and should appreciate and should help to protect. So they usually do field trips and try it through a scientific process, uh, <clears throat> study their nearby area and identify in, uh, some very unique biodiversity spots. And they're starting to create some management systems and to have a, a project to help their communities. <clears throat> 
So this human-centered approach and understanding that perhaps the STEM club should be focused on teachers to help us implement it in different um, high schools and in different backgrounds uh, in Chile uh, have allowed us to work with more than 1,000 and I think around 1,500 1, students each week in more than 150 high schools from different areas of Chile and has been allow us to create this scalability model uh, <coughs> but yet again it's not our challenge of this global perspective was not on how this STEM program should be adapted into the curriculum, into the subjects that they want to work with, but rather that coming down to the basics of with whom I'm working with and how I can create a program that is adapted to their cultural and most importantly their background. So what I would like to sum up is that <coughs> For us, an integrative approach uh, for the school is the best understanding that STEM education cannot be isolated from all of the other areas of education, whether that be personal development or arts or um, sports. I mean, you can have all of them connected and that's the key and that's the beauty of STEM education because you are not working into the development of subjects but you are actually working into the development of science thinking of how a person can think and can approach a problem also that if you want to have a very successful adaptation of a program of a problem of a program should actually be focused on the community needs and what is the community that you want to work with is needing or lacking and how can that STEM program be helpful for them. I mean, if your STEM program makes sense to the to your user, that would be a much more successful program that whether the final user doesn't connect or doesn't understand why is that important. Third is that you need to evaluate the needs of your users and you need to try to make this co-design process and to invite your final users into the design table of your team and have them have not only an opinion but a decision into that design. I think that could save a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of mistakes that you may have in the process. Fourth is that you need to have and you need to be willing to adapt the program um, usually you are usually we are afraid when we identified a very good program outside we are afraid to make mistakes and we think that if it works in other contexts it has to work exactly in mind I think that's the mistake to think that you can just take any program of STEM education and just implement it the same way that the other uh, developers implemented it in their location uh, that's a recipe for disaster as we could like and we would like to call it because that's not understanding that you're working with people and people are very different according to their ages, the places they live and their cultural background. I think to have in mind that this adaptability is the key to having this global approach to STEM education can help you uh, have a very successful program and finally is that you need to understand that you are moving between a multi stakeholders in which that you are not only working with students but also working with teachers high school educational administrators scientists and everything and perhaps if you are focused on solving a social or science education problem perhaps your your beneficiary or your user is not the, the students and to solve that problem you need to work with some other of the stakeholders related to that, whether they'll be teachers or the high school. And having clear that to solve a problem, perhaps it's to about creating some competences in the system, um, it might be very helpful to have a very successful outcome. So again, it's always to have clear that the final 
beneficiary is your purpose. So this all this global approach is not only just to come into the basics that you need to be centered, you, you need to have a human centered program. And that also understanding the STEM education, it's immersed in a global context. So if you don't make it clear to your user that STEM education is a very important and how STEM education can help them, uh, it usually is not helpful at all. <clears throat> and for me personally, it's understanding that STEM education is for our responsible citizenship. If we have a good STEM education and kids or teachers and all the communities and all the citizens are actually trained and have a good STEM education, they eventually will be better citizens that can make informed decisions and <clears throat> that can have a more active role in the society. Um, also, it's very important in this global approach uh, to have or to be part of the international talk in this area. And I will leave you here for links to four international organizations that you can be part of or you can participate in their annual meetings in which we usually attend and share our experiences into how we are implemented these projects. You have the International Council of Association for Science Education, which they do an annual uh, biannual meeting. You have the Latin American Network, Red Pop UNESCO, which we reunite uh, every two years as well. And this year's meeting is in Buenos Aires. Uh, you have the MILSET, which is an international movement for liaison activities in science and technology. And you have the American NSTA, which is focused on science teachers, and which is very good to understand what is actually happening in the classroom. So thank you very much for listening. And now if you have any questions, I would be more than happy and willing to answer them. Thank you very much, Oscar, uh, for your presentation. It was fantastic. We, we got a few questions from the audience that we would like to ask you. Uh, and we will start with a question from Catherine Sudden. And the question is, uh, what methods, what methods do you use for long-term evaluation of your programs? Do you use an external evaluation group? <clears throat> okay. So, uh, we have different approaches to evaluation and long-term evaluation of our projects. Um, for example, the one according into the science camp, considering that people act, have to apply to the program and we put a number on their evaluation, on their application. So we have a score of all of the people that participate and we have a, a cut line. So there we used a, a statistical model which allow us to work with the students. Uh, for example, uh, if our students is, uh, I don't know, the cut line of the, of the applicant was in four, we take the students that were selected to the program that are nearby this four number and we use the students that are down this four number and we use the statistical regression uh, to see if we have a difference in this project, in this, in this people and in the, in the skills we want to approve. And we have evaluation at the beginning, at the end of the program, and we have evaluation after six months, three times after they finish the, the, the summer camp. Um, evaluation of this project is always a challenge, not, on the, not only on the statistical model you want to use to evaluate, but also to find the right instrument to measure the competence you are trying to improve. Uh, so that's the main challenge. And for example, for the students that work in our high school, we have used uh, control groups, uh, which is usually a group of, uh, of kids that are from the same high school, uh, but 
are not participated in the program. There is a lot of uh, <clears throat> papers going around right now about the, the approaches you can have for evaluation and answering if you mentioned is an external evaluation, yes, uh, we, used, we used two approaches uh, in our team. We have the, uh, for example, the program manager team, which is the one that design and implement the project. And we have an independent evaluation team inside our foundation that is not involved in the implementation process and not, is only focused as an external observer and an implementation of the evaluation. And right now, after six years of the program, we are uh, consulting with an internet with an external group, which is JPAL. You perhaps you might know it. This is an international measurement laboratory, and with this external evaluation, uh, we want to evaluate the long-term impact after the six years of what happened after the kids leave the high school and what are they doing right now. It is a very important aspect of our work but it's always a challenge to find the right method of evaluation. Okay, we have uh, another question. Um, what age groups can be involved in a STEM camp? Is it possible to manage camps for younger children, 10 to 12 years old? <clears throat> yes, actually, our main <clears throat> camp is focused on 14 to 18. Um, because of the location we visited, it's much uh, safer to work with uh, older students. Uh, but we've also implemented camps from around 9 years old to 13. Um, it's possible to implement it. We need to just adapt them. And for the national context, means that those camps should be shorter. Um, should be focused on more recreational activities or into a different approach into the specific workshops we implement. Um, but it's totally feasible and possible to work with younger students. And actually we have a, a STEM camp for teachers. So just as the strategy we apply with students, we invite 40 teachers each year to participate in the STEM camp and it's focused on developing uh, teachers skills for them and how they can improve the way they teach science in their classroom. Okay, we have time for one more question. There's another question about do you offer a program guide that can be later customized um, for, for other areas, uh, specifically for implementation in uh, in Kenya or, or Africa? Uh, right now, our expansion model of the foundation uh, has been focused on the foundation opening an office and implement its program there. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't designed an implementation guidelines for our programs into other contexts right now. We are actually evaluating if we are one of the other approach is to generate local partnerships and transferring our methodology to other organizations abroad. Right now we're on the process of, this, of deciding which is our expansion model, um, even from franchise, social franchise of our educational approaches, or in some countries the foundation operating itself uh, in that country. Uh, I'd be happy to hear more about people that want to partner with us, perhaps into generating pilots in other countries. And we've had experiences in that in Mexico and in Argentina and Uruguay. So I think we can find a way to work together. Excellent. Um, so I think our, our time is up for, for questions. Um, wanted to share this quick poll for you. If you can take just a minute to, uh, to answer, um, that can be great. And I wanted to thank everyone very much for attending today's webinar.
We really hope you enjoyed the session with Oscar, and we will share the recording of the webinar and the slides on our website at gocoderz.com. And we'll make sure to send a link and a follow-up email to everyone who attended today. We also invite you to keep the conversation going on our Facebook STEM group. We already have several hundred STEM teachers and leaders uh, that have joined, and you can find it by searching the Facebook group STEM for All. Um, and Oscar and part of the U Science Foundation team are already active members and can answer and connect with you on any questions you may have in the group. So that is STEM, the number four and all uh, in Facebook. And if, if you are interested in more information about Coder Z and uh, programs that have to do with virtual robots and robotics, please reach out to us on Go Coder Z. You can also sign up for a free 14-day free trial on our website to try it for yourself. We also offer several public demos several times a week and would love to hear from you. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us today and have a great afternoon.